here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> boom, boom again. <laughs> so, um, and there's no public comments for the closed session, no. <clears throat> so in closed session, we're gonna be doing a, an expulsion referral, 2.11, 2.2 certificated public employee appointment, 2.3 classified public employee appointment, 2.4 negotiations update, 2.5 public employee discipline dismissal release, 2.6 claims for damages, Keenan claim number 564946, do I have to see all these numbers? Whoa. Um, 2.7 ratify workers compensation claim number 8106-02-0126 and 8106-01-0086. <laughs> 2 point eight ratified workers compensation claim number four five seven two eight six and two point nine conference with legal counsel anticipated lit litigation now into closed session <laughs> Okay, everybody sit down. Everybody, hello. <laughs> Welcome everyone to our meeting of February 13th, 2019, <laughs> New Year. <laughs> and um, I will start the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance with Jennifer Holm. Okay, si necesitas traducciones, se puede hablar con Virginia, ahí está, para que le dé los aparatos que se puede usar para, para, para hacerlo. <laughs> um, so we're going to have superintendent by Dr. Rodriguez comment. So last Friday, I had the opportunity to spend my monthly day in the life um, with our painting supervisor, Herman, so you can see him up there. Um, we spent the day removing graffiti, repairing a classroom teacher's wall, and inspecting upcoming um, paint jobs. Um, Herman really is a superstar from his actions. You can tell that he takes um, great pride in his work and is committed to improving the facilities for our students and staff. And some of those pictures, that one on the bottom, I didn't know he was even taking. <laughs> so, um, el viernes pasado tuve la oportunidad de pasar un día en la vida de, un, de nuestro supervisor de pintora Herman. Pasamos el día um, removiendo graffiti, reparando la pared de un salón y también do, haciendo inspecciones para los próximos trabajos de pintura. Y Herman sí fue y es una un superestrella. Por sus acciones se nota que tiene orgullo en su trabajo y está comprometido de mejorar todas las instalaciones para nuestros estudiantes y personal. And so the monthly day in the life events um, not only provide me with hands-on experience and a unique perspective, but it also leads to change. Um, so I wanted to. Um, I was talking to Herman about it, and he was like, "I don't think people know about that." So he, so I decided I would, I would say a few examples. So, for example, from the day in the life of a bus driver, we added two dry, um, dry route days. Um, from the elementary librarian, we restored their hours back to eight hours. 
the VAPA teacher, we negotiated with PVST the roving stipend, the custodian, we're purchasing the additional equipment that they need to take care of the site properly. And for the painter, we're actually going to be hiring a fourth painter to cover the large backlog of painting um, jobs that are still in the system. And so mis eventos mensuales de día de la, día, la vida de alguien se brinda una experiencia para mí no solamente um, una un punto de vista muy diferente, pero también um, hay acciones um, en que hacemos. Entonces, por ejemplo, el conductor de autobús, um, ten, ellos ahora tienen dos días extras para hacer sus rutas antes de estar con los niños. El biblioteca, la, la, um, los bibliotecarios de primaria ahora tiene ocho horas como antes. Um, el maestro de VAPA um, negociamos el, um, el, el dinero para los que están um, yendo a todos los salones. Um, el pintor ahora vamos a contratar un cuarto, um, un, un cuarto pintar, pintor para cubrir el gran número de obras que tenemos que todavía están allí. So I always look forward to continuing these experiences each month. If you have something I should do, let me know. So, siempre me gusta continuar esas ex experiencias y si hay alguien, hay un trabajo que debo hacer, uh, mándame un correo electrónico y I may be there. Okay, bye bye. Uh, we're now going to have the governing board comments, and I'm going to start with this time Danny, and then I'll skip myself and come back, I guess. Good evening, everybody. Um, glad to be here tonight. Good, good to see everybody, teachers, everybody in, in this meeting. Um, I just wanted to really, really briefly, I got to attend the, the SPIN, the, the network. They had an event at E Hall. Uh, I met with Heather Gorman. It was a really good um, event. Well, kids with special needs in the PVUE's district, so I just wanted to mentioned Heather Gorman for doing a good job with that event. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm going to keep it brief because I know we have families and students waiting and it's getting late. But um, myself and a couple of other board members attended the Pajaro Valley Chamber of Commerce dinner, which was more than a thousand people at the wow. fairgrounds at the, Chris I think the Crisetti Hall, um, where we actually honored um, a longstanding um, athletic director from Watsonville High, and I think his name is Brad Hubbard. Was that his name, everybody? Yeah, it's um, Brad Hubbard. He was um, honored as the man of the year to a standing ovation. And so um, as part of the PVUSD family, we thank him and his family for all the long, long hours and the leadership and changing so many kids' lives down at Watsonville. It was, a, it was beautiful. Thank you. Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Over the past week, I and was... Say your name. Oh yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Rosalie, student trustee. <coughs> so over the past <coughs> week, I was in talks with the Aptos High principal, Ms. Pugh, and the assistant principal, Ms. Edwards, regarding the AP program, as students have begun to pay for the, this year for their AP exams. I got the chance to take a look at the AP five-year school score, which illustrated the annual change in the percentage of AP students who are taking the AP class and also passing the AP exam with a score of three or higher. Mm -hmm. It brought me much joy as I saw that the Aptos High school, school score um, show that, there, that we have been above average percentagely, percentage wise, as students have passed the AP exam with a seven overall of 72%, while the California state average is at a 63. So not only that, but there are also there is also a noticeable upward trend happening with the amount of students taking AP classes. In 2014, the Aptos High total was 294 students enrolled in an AP class and 590 AP exams taken that year. As of 2018, which was last year, those numbers have risen to 366 students taking an AP class and a total of 674 AP exams taken and passed. Though the school year has not ended, the 2019 school year is on its way to continue this trend, and as which has already surpassed last year's numbers of how many students are enrolled in an AP course. Though I only have the AP, 
Aptal's high statistics with me. I do hope I get the chance to see how the other high schools are doing with their AP program and hope to see a positive trend happening at their schools as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Maria. Hi, everyone. Um, so last fall, I requested our CAT coordinator, Rob Hoffman, to meet with the Monterey Central Labor Council. Rob met with both Ron um, Kishir and Cesar Lara from the Central Labor Council, and I wanted to publicly um, share what resulted from the conversation because I'm very excited about what, what possibility there could be with this partnership. Mr. Lara uh, from the Central Labor Council has agreed to provide industry contracts for all industry labor unions he supports for PUSD to reach out to. Mr. Um, Cheshire, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his- um, Ron Cheshire. Thank you, mm -hmm. Cheshire. Sure. Share a desire to connect with PBUSD Construction CT Pathways to discuss aligning industry relevant curriculum called MC3. He's willing to provide seed money for a construction student leadership organization to start up and develop a program that is self-funding. I think this is a very unique opportunity that uh, we as PBUSD <coughs> should consider, especially if um, we are piloting our own in-house CTE program, but in addition to that, uh, making sure that they, a, they are A through G um, certified. And last week, um, I attended a Watsonville Parks and Recreation Strategic Plan stakeholders meeting. It was a pleasure to partake in the conversation along with community partners across the Santa Cruz County to help shape the future goals and priorities of parks and recreation services here in Watsonville. Some of the recurrent feedback from stakeholders was the possibility of opening our schools, um, campuses, playgrounds to the community. I am interested in continuing this conversation um, at our next Intergovernmental Committee meeting, which is coming up in March, I believe. And lastly, I'm looking forward to attending both the DLAC and the PB Education Foundation meeting next week. <laughs> Thank you. Jennifer. So. I mean, Jen. <laughs> Jennifer works too. Um, well, she's so, Jennifer though, next to you. <laughs> so in the next couple of weeks, um, I've attended the Rio de Mar uh, Science Fair and it was great seeing you know, how all the ways that you know, kids were exploring the questions they had using the scientific method. Um, I also held my first open office hour session at Ground Control Coffee and spoke with uh, parents about the challenges facing our, our students who have learning differences. And that dovetailed nicely with going later that evening to the, um, attending the SELPA committee, Community Advisory Committee's Anxiety Trauma Presentation. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to, um, to continued conversations about supporting the learning needs of all of our students. And I also attended uh, the Aptos High Mariner Expo. Really appreciated the new format of that expo and really having it be very welcoming and you know, accessible to having conversations with different <coughs> groups. Um, and then near and dear to my heart at that was, you know, the you know, presentations by the choir and the drum line. And, you know, I, I know firsthand what a difference, you know, this can make for engagement, you know, for students with my own kids and then for myself as a student. And seeing these programs grow and flourish is incredibly exciting to me. Now Jennifer. <laughs> Good evening. Sorry we've been late. Um, but I have a public statement I'd like to make. After the last board meeting, I woke to packages of frozen meat left on my property. I took this as a threat, um, and so did the Watsonville Police Department, and they are looking into this matter. When my daughter looks at me and tells me, Mommy, I wish you did not win, this makes me very sad. Yes, it has made me sad that our school board election, a new representation on 12-4-2018 has come to this. Threatening board members at their home is not acceptable behavior. Bullying is not acceptable behavior. This position is about our children, making our schools safer, providing a more well-rounded curriculum. I ran my campaign based on the foundation that we needed new leadership on this board, that we needed to work together as a community to have a welcoming voice in our schools and in our board. I ran and campaigned to recruit and retain qualified teachers and staff to help our children provide for their f future and to have the tools of success that we need in the classroom. I would like the board to get back to what the school board is supposed to be about, the most important thing, our children. I met this week with Superintendent and Joe and we talked about budget. 
this is what I'm currently reading through. It's the school district's budget. We are looking for ways that we can recruit and retain our teachers. We're looking for ways that we can recruit and retain our staff by seeing where we can cut costs so that our curriculum is consistent in all of our classrooms. We have small class sizes for all of our <coughs> teachers to manage. We have class sizes for special ed that they can manage and teach our special ed students. We are looking at this. I read this. This is what my homework's been the past few nights. This is to me what's important is about getting those tools into our classrooms and to our children so that they can have a bright future. I look forward to some site meetings that I have been in touch with principals at different schools at that are going to be scheduled. I look forward to our next meeting, the Intergovernmental Continental meeting, working with Maria. And I also look forward to working with Nancy Village and the Adult Ed Continuing Program. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, good Jeff. evening and welcome, everyone. And. Um, <laughs> Well, Trustee Shocker, I um, just have to say I'm sorry to hear about this and um, the threat upon you and your family, and no elected public official should ever be, have to be faced with such a thing. Um, aside from that, um, well, this year is off to a fast and great start. <clears throat> I recently attended the Watsonville Women's Club luncheon and got to hear our district's very own Nancy Adams presentation on her work with our students in our community and our district regarding native birds in our local wetlands. And what a wonderful presentation it was. And I know she's not here tonight, but I just want to say thank you, Nancy. Hope you hear this later. Um, I would also like to take a moment and mention for our senior female students who are looking to go on to college next year, two scholarship opportunities within our community because that time is now and coming up. One is with the Watsonville Women's Club and one is with the Seroptimist Club within Watsonville. And information can be found on both of these clubs' websites on how to apply. I strongly encourage our females in the community, our senior females, to apply. Um, there is also another scholarship opportunity in our community available to graduating seniors at the Pajaro Valley who are looking to go on to college next year through the Pajaro Valley Historical Society. And again, information can be found on their website for that. Again, I strongly encourage our senior students looking to go on to college to apply. This time is now coming um, in these next few months. Um, I also had the opportunity, like a few of my colleagues, to attend the Pajaro Valley Agriculture Chamber of Commerce annual, annual awards event in which, again, our district's very own Brad Hubbard was honored as Man of the Year for his wonderful work at Watsonville High School. Um, and our community's very own Alex Solano was also honored with the Lifetime Achievement Award for his work and service in our community, including and not limited to his years of serving on this district's governing board in the early years of this district's initial unification. So uh, congratulations again to both of these outstanding men and members of our community. We should all be thankful for their great work and contributions to our community. Also, President Trustee Osmondson, it has always been the district's core philosophy and direction to put our students at the very center and heart of all that we do as a district. This has been the district's philosophy and direction long before any of us have been here. And I am so glad to see we are continuing to do that now. Thank you. My turn. <laughs> so, um, I was, I was very involved the last two days in um, Salinas with the, um, the California Labor Management Initiative, cultivating a culture of collaboration focused on student learning. And it was for um, yesterday, and today, and yesterday, I'm going to say to you, <laughs> yesterday was my birthday. <laughs> and it's pretty cool that I have my birthday on the same day that Abraham Lincoln was born, too. That's pretty cool. <laughs> and so it was such an exciting time um, the last two days to actually learn about um, collaboration. And we had two school districts that talked about have they've put into 
place in their school districts, this whole collaboration effort. One was Santa Cruz City Schools, and the other one was Santa Clara Unified School District, I think it is. Um, and I could talk to you about all the stuff that we learned, and I will definitely at some point <laughs> talk to you about it. But um, there was a lot of people from our school district there. There was actually seven people from CSEA there, seven people from us, um, of our CSEA folks were there. There was five, I'm, I think I'm right, from uh, American Federation of Teachers, the T Teachers Union, of course, Francisco and everybody else. Um, and there was six from administration, and um, I could say all their names, but well, I'll tell you. <laughs> of course, Dr. Rodriguez. And then Chona Kilian was there, Allison, Susie Wawa, <laughs> Joe Domingo. <laughs> um, let's see, and also Clint from who is works in administrative services. He was there too, and also myself and Danny was there at least one day, <laughs> at least one day. Um, <laughs> there um, to pe from the board, um, and it was really um, a great day. And then today, after we finished a little bit early today, all of our group, our whole group. Uh, went to the um, human HR, <laughs> what is it called? The HR conference room, and we, we had a big planning meeting after we had done these two days to figure out how, you know, we figured out all the stuff that we're going to pursue uh, for this plan on a collaboration together. Um, and we, we knew that we had to get, for one thing, CSEA much more involved in what we do. Um, at one point, I, I heard from Francisco, I wasn't even aware of this, but that we had just tried to figure out how to do something like this before, but it didn't work out. And one of the reasons was, according to Francisco, too, is that, that CSEA was not at all involved in it. So now we have, you know, all these CSEA people ready <laughs> to go for it. <laughs> so that's pretty exciting. Um, and... Um, <laughs> I well I don't know if Angelica's here she is <laughs> I screwed up and did not go to the um, Head Start Policy Committee meeting because it was on a different day than I usually go to it um, and so like I completely was stupid and forgot um, the other thing I did though I went to the um, Peace and Unity March in Watsonville and they have been doing this Peace and Unity March for 20 Four years, 24 years it's been going on. And it happened um, after, we'll say, after the killing of a young a, a little girl, actually, named Jessica, who was nine years old, and her brother Jorge, who was, I think, 15 years old. And after that, that's when they started up what they call the Brown Berets. They started the Brown Berets, and then they started these Peace and Unity marches. And in our march this time, and also Danny was there too. <laughs> Danny was with me there too. And it, at this at this march, we actually marched to a little park, little park place that was right on Salinas Road. And we planted a Japanese Japanese blossoming tree, and we're going to have a bench there with the names of Jessica and her brother Cortez is what their names are. We're gonna have a bench with their names on it, which was pretty cool. Thanks. <laughs>
on the website, you can pay for your AP exams for all students taking AP classes as well as other students that still want to take the AP exam. Um, on February 6th, we had a presentation and uh, the PAC and for eighth grade uh, parents and students to get a look at Aptos High, as well as open house in the new gym. And parents got to talk to all the teachers and all the electives that you can take at Aptos High. And then this Saturday, we or last Saturday, we also had Saturday school. So for arts, our theater program is preparing for their spring musical Romeo and Juliet. And performances will be held mid-April in our PAC. Um, choir is preparing for their spring concert, Celebrate in Song. Um, and that is March 12th from 7 to 9.30 p.m. also in our PAC. And then our theater students are also um, really excited to go on their annual trip to Ashland, Oregon um, at the end of March. And they will attend um, many different plays and workshops to improve their skills. And these pictures are from their trip last year. So for activities, a couple weeks ago we had our winter ball at Seascape Golf Club and we ended up having 450 people there, which was way more than prom last year. Wow. Our community service fair will be on February 21st and our set day for prom is on April 26th. So in athletics, our boys and girls basketball teams both won the SCCAL championship game on Saturday. Yes, I know that. And the basketball women. Yeah. Women basketball. And we start CCS next week or possibly like Friday or Saturday. And then our soccer teams had their senior night tonight and last night. And our girls are currently 12 and 5, so have a good chance at going to CCS. Our wrestling team is currently in CCS. And our spring sports have started, and we offer – Softball, volleyball, tennis, golf, baseball, swimming, track and field, and lacrosse in the spring. Wow, lots of stuff. Thank you guys. Thank you. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> student recognition. <laughs> Tonight we are representing um, who is going to be the employee, I mean employee, <laughs> student of the year, Gabriel Castro, H.A. Hyde Elementary. <laughs> Guess you're gonna have to wait. Um, my name is Brooke Hopkins. I'm the proud principal at H.A. Hyde Elementary. And I want to introduce uh, Gabriel Castro here as our student of the year, and also his teacher, um, Dora Salazar, who's going to tell us a little bit more about Gabriel. There he is. There's Gabriel. <laughs> I was wondering, where is he? <laughs> um, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting us. It is an honor for me to present this award to Gabriel Castro. He is an outstanding student. Um, he has shown and maintained excellence in the classroom by progressing and learning fifth grade curriculum. Gabriel acts with integrity during independent work time and he has high expectations for himself. As he always completes his work, he is asked for missing work when he does not attend the school. Um, he is really show outstanding characteristics not only as a student, but as also as a Hyde community member, as he shows respect to adults, um, classmates, and uh, school property, he follows our high pride expectations on a daily basis.
Right in the front, Gabriel. Get right in the front. <laughs> Nice smile. <laughs> and the next, and this might be harder for me to say than in Spanish, is Demian Matlo. Am I saying that correctly? Demian. Demian Matlo. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right, well, good evening, President Osmondson, Dr. Rodriguez, and board members. My name is Karen Lane, and I am so honored to be the principal of Valencia Elementary School and be with you here this evening to celebrate our sixth grade student of the year. Uh, we select our student, I don't know if it's unique to us or not, but we, uh, we have four Valencia values of respect, responsibility, kindness, and best effort. And we give all of the sixth grade students uh, a list of those values and a list of all of the students in their class, and we ask them in thinking of those values, which students pop into your mind? And they can put students in multiple categories. We also give that same sheet to our staff. And so uh, that is how we selected our student of the year, Damien. And he's, he's kind of one of our own for sure, but on a next level. Um, he was my student in first grade when I was still teaching at Valencia. And his mom, Deborah Matlow, was one of our stellar standout teachers. And so um, this is extra special for us this year. Um, I love quotes, and I stumbled upon one the other day that says, being someone's favorite teacher is by far one of the best compliments that you can ever receive. And I truly believe that. And when I was talking with Deborah about this honor for Damien, uh, she said, you know, Damien's loved Valencia. He's connected with and felt supported by all of his teachers. But his fifth grade teacher, Aaron Farrar, he, he shared with her was kind of the, the first teacher that really got him as a learner and really challenged him as a learner. So I invited her here to be with me this evening to help celebrate Damien. So I'm going to welcome her now. Good evening, board. I'm Erin Farrar, Damien's fifth grade teacher. He's now in sixth grade. So um, I'm going to start with I've known Damien for a while now, a little emotional. Uh, but we really met when he borrowed a Harry Potter book in second grade. <laughs> we had a few chats about the series, and I knew then that Damien was going to be a fun student to teach someday. As luck would have it, I had the good fortune of being Damien's fifth grade teacher and was able to develop a great rapport with him. I can say for certain that Damien consistently has, has his head in the game, both on and off the court. Damien is an athlete a scholar, and a natural leader. <clears throat> Excuse me. He loves playing sports like basketball and soccer. He plays on competitive teams and just for fun. During PE activities, Damien and his fellow All-Stars effortlessly inspire participation of all students by demonstrating sportsmanship and verbalizing athletic strategies. Damien's enthusiasm, smile, and positive encouragement is contagious, and everyone catches it. Damien regularly and modestly leads collaborative discussions in all subjects. He proposes intense, deep, thought-provoking questions and demonstrates enthusiasm for learning and challenge every day, all day. In my opinion, Damien has truly opened his mind to analytically and emotionally exploring all perspectives. He's able to wrap his brain around a concept and convey it so that everyone around him is comfortable. Damien is extremely eloquent and his writing is insightful. He has command of vocabulary, sentence structure, and persuasive techniques. His writing has been compared to that of a journalist. As you might infer, Damien consistently works hard to meet any goals he sets for himself. He not only met the academic goals of meeting his fifth grade standards, he literally knocked them out of the park and he hit a grand slam by earning perfect SBAC state scores. Wow. Wow. <clears throat> These scores came with Damien's deliberate dedication and perseverance. Congratulations, Damien. But Ms. Farrar's not done yet. <laughs> Damien, you are truly an inspiration to me. You once wrote about the legend Magic Johnson. 
And so this has been my opportunity to write and share about you, our legend, Damian Matlow. Damian, I am so proud you were elected Valencia's MVP. And that is that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, all students of the year. <laughs> so um, I'm asking for approval of the agenda, and I'm, I, I want a motion, and I would like to ask someone to defer 9.21 after 13.0, if someone could do that. Can I have a motion? I make a motion. I'll second. No, I mean to, and say that, too. Okay. 9.20 to remove. Sorry. 9.21 after. 9.21. After 13. Move it to after 13. I make a motion. 13.0. Yeah, thank you. I second that motion. All right. Um, can I have a vote? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Approval of the January 23rd board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? I make a motion to approve. Second. I will call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, number six is visitor non-agenda items. So, Danny. That is me. And first off, we have Susie DeRosa, a teacher. If she's still here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so now we have Laura Zucker, a teacher from H.A. Height. doesn't really make sense. <laughs> she thinks it'll make sense. Um, okay, hi. Uh, so I'm Laura Zucker, a speech therapist at H.A. Hyde School. And I want to say, first of all, I really enjoyed everyone's comments. I like being in special ed. I'm glad that Danny talked about going to the SPIN conference that I missed, but SPIN is a great organization. It's really the, I mean, they do a really good job in this county, both in s North County and South County, and they're really helpful if you have children with different needs, as my husband and I do, and they're, so they're really, really helpful. I was glad that Jennifer Schacher talked about our need for s smaller classes in special day classes, but that's something we're going to be starting negotiations, and it'd be great if we had a, uh, a cap on class size. Um, it would be great for the kids, make it safe for the children, they'd be more able to learn, and frankly, we'd be able to attract and retain special ed teachers if we had actual hard caps and not just suggestions. Um, so those are very important things. But I was really glad what everyone said. Everyone talked about either teachers, like Trustee Acosta did, or about the kids, and that was really cool. And I wanted to thank, I didn't get to thank folks who went to Sacramento with us and our two trustees who went. That was really great. A sorry. Doi, three. I'm sorry, Karen, because we've known each other so long. <laughs> yes. Okay, so, but I wanted to, I wanted to, unfortunately, this would be brief. There's something kind of unpleasant I want to talk about. And I know y'all have been reading in the paper. I'm sorry that Mr. Beecher's not here because I don't want to talk behind his back. But um, he's been writing letters and about saying that there's been a violation of the Brown Act. He's actually gone to the DA. I watched his comments in the last meeting. And first of all, I think we have a lawyer here. 
I'm kind of thinking the Brown Act was not violated because the election hadn't been certified. I'm not a lawyer, but I do think that these laws are written probably for all of us to understand. I did get a legal opinion off the internet, it's here somewhere, that says that elections are certified so that you know when the Brown Act will be violated. And since this is a meeting that five board members somehow or one in different configure whatever, this supposed meeting happened November 27th and then the uh, election was not certified till uh, the first Friday in, in December, therefore they were candidates, or most of them, th three of them were candidates when they met and not trustees. But I don't really understand, that's my interpretation of the Brown Act. At any rate, Mr. Beecher has kind of made, you know, Trustee DeSerpa, you brought up a really good question. Was there a violation? That was done in good faith. But now, unfortunately, um, Mr. Beecher has made it kind of divisive un and undemocratic. Um, he's saying that he would retract his complaint, his formal complaint to the DA if he gets what he wants, if maybe five trustees or maybe just one, Trustee Acosta resigns. It looks like he's trying to redo the election. It looks very undemocratic. It also looks divisive. It's like he's implying that this board um, is having some infighting, and I know that's not happening, and we certainly hope it's not happening. Um, it just looks like a political stunt. I'm sorry on Mr. Beecher's part, and I don't like to say that, but I'm hoping that's not true, but it just doesn't look good. We want y'all to work together. Everyone here was elected by us, and we've worked with all of you. We haven't always agreed with all of you, but we've supported a lot of you, and at one point all agreed on things. So we want this board to work together as a group um, and to get beyond this stuff that's been in the news about the Brown Act and Mr. Beecher's implication, you know, his trying to make it a political issue um, so that we can get to these important issues that the, that'll help the children and help our community. So thank you. Thank you. Susie DeRosa. Uh, good evening, Dr. Rodriguez and board. Uh, thank you for having us here tonight. Um, I just want to start by saying that I truly believe that all of us here are, are here for the right reasons and that we all have good intentions. Uh, however, recent newspaper articles and letters to the editor have seemed divisive and distracting. And I just want to urge you to put these aside, these distractions, and work in unity for the betterment of our schools and community. Um, after all, if we can't do it at this level of government, how can we expect it at our federal level, right? It's sort of like it just is kind of a little bit of like, wait, that's happening here too? It can't. Um, I just am hoping that we can really work together and I feel like we just have enough divisiveness in our world, in our country, that I'm really hoping that, that that's not what's happening here and that it doesn't. Um, it's funny, I didn't really want to talk tonight, but <laughs> Laura does so much for us, um, for the teachers and the school community that I couldn't say no. And so here I am. <laughs> and I really didn't want to speak, and I'm thinking as I'm driving home, what am I going to say, what am I going to say? And there was a car right in front of me at a stoplight. And on its um, license plate holder, there were just three words. And the top word was adapt. And the bottom words were humble thyself. So I just want to leave with that. Thank you. Thank you. I have to keep turning this on. <laughs> now we're going to have employee organization comments. Um, we're going to have PVFT, the union PVFT, speak first. Francisco. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good to see you. Yeah, again. <laughs> <laughs> again. Um, I've been, I've been so as, as was mentioned, Francisco Rodriguez with Pajar Valley Federation of Teachers. Um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we the last two days we had been we have been um, with a, a group of other districts, other teachers, and other administrators um, talking about how uh, to work together 
um, in a way that puts uh, students first and makes it um, easy to do so and in a way that uh, we are all respected and our uh, rights as well as the uh, district and board members' uh, obligations and to, to the community and, and the accountability that they, uh, that, or that you, know, you all must uh, keep uh, is taken into consideration. So uh, we're, we're hoping that this is a, a good start. I know uh, over the last uh, few months, um, we we have uh, or you have approved a number of uh, memorandums of understanding that uh, I believe uh, are are helping our students, our teachers, um, and our, our administrators. Um, we we have a big test coming up, and that is uh, the start of negotiations again. And uh, we're hoping that we're able to continue um, having. Uh, or, or keeping the students uh, first, first of all, in mind, and the teachers that are uh, meant to educate them, um, making sure that they have the resources to stay in the area and to become uh, permanent employees of this district. So uh, with that, um, your next item uh, will give you more information on what we have in mind. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, CSEA, are you here? So many of you were here today, the last two days. <laughs> Where are you today? <laughs> well, there was seven of them in our last two days. It's been good. <coughs> um, now we can do PAVAM. Is there any PAVAM person? And last, CWA, Communication Workers of America. Okay, public hearing, boom, boom, boom. PVFT initial sunshine proposal. So we can begin the hearing. Uh, yes, President Osmondson, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, I defer this to PVFT President Francisco Rodriguez to eloquently explain the contract articles contained in this item and bring sunshine in this rain. Yeah, we need sunshine. <laughs> oh no, sun, rain's good too. <laughs> um, thank you. As we were saying before, you, you probably all uh, listened to the uh, State of the State address um, yesterday. Um, as you know, uh, the governor uh, is uh, very interested in making sure that uh, per pupil spending in California uh, is higher than it currently is, um, and there appears to be the resources for that. And so. Uh, we're hoping that uh, together we can come to an agreement on uh, how we can move forward in uh, retaining um, our, our teachers, attracting and retaining our teachers, and improving our um, student achievement as well. Uh, to give you a little more information on that, on that is uh, Nellie Baqueta Boggs, who is our chief negotiator. Good evening, board. <coughs> Dr. Rodriguez. Um, yeah, so um, on the heels of talking about LMI, I think it's a very positive thing. Um, and I hope that uh, our upcoming negotiations is, uh, can go smoothly. Um, the articles that we're going to open with are uh, Article 4, Workload Out and Hours, Article 6, Class Size, Article 7, Wages and Related Matters, Article 13, Evaluations, Article 20, which is um, in regards to the Mentor pro Program, and Article 28, Early Childhood Education Program. And then during the process of negotiations, if there are other uh, articles that we need to open up to Sunshine, then we will do that. So um, I hope that <coughs> this process is um, positive and that we all, we all want the best for our students and healthy learning, healthy teachers, um, healthy environments, not overcrowded ones. Um, so thank you. Thank you. So public speakers. Are there any public speakers? No. no. Okay. Are there any are there any questions from the board? 
<laughs> it's pretty clear. <laughs> okay, we're going to close out our public hearing and go back to our regular meeting. Um, and do I do it again? So 9.1, Pottle Valley Federation of Teachers initial sunshine proposal to our school district for collective bargaining agreement negotiations, blah, blah, 2019 20, 2020 21, and 2021 22 school years. Shona Helian. Uh, yes, as this. Um, thank you, President Osmondson. Uh, this was the item that was presented for the public hearing. And we are recommending that the PVFT initial sunshine proposal be uh, approved as presented. I would like to move approval uh, to approve this item. I look forward to engaging with PVFT in productive negotiations. I'll second I'll that. Second. No public speakers? Danny? Okay, any more discussion from the board? Okay, um, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> oh, seven zero. Mm -hmm. Seven zero. Okay. <coughs> Okay, now we're going to do a lot of board policies, which are pretty much together with SB, CSBA, and so we don't have a lot to say about them ultimately, but we have to do our second reading of each of them. <laughs> okay, so our first one is 5145.9, um, hate motivated behavior, and where is... Where are you? Come here. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> yeah, so we he already did the presentation last time, so we really don't we don't really need to do a presentation and we don't have any public speakers and there is probably not any discussion from the board, I wouldn't think. Okay. <laughs> I mean <laughs> Okay. Can I have um a motion to approve? Yes, so move approval for um, board policy 5145.9 as presented by the administration. Second. Uh, all those in favor? I'm sorry, can I ask one question? Didn't Trustee DeSerpa ask for some language change at the last meeting and was that implemented? Yes. Okay. Yes, Thank you. It's highlighted in red. Thank you. It was implemented. There were, yeah, there were, three, there were three items brought up last time. Changed I, I just couldn't remember exactly what her requests were, so thank you. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? 7 0. <coughs> okay, the 9.3 second reading board policy update 5145.7 sexual harassment. <coughs> and um, probably no board discussion. I just have a question, really quick. Okay. So, on the following item, there is stated explicitly what sexual harassment is, and I'm wondering, unless I missed it, I'm wondering why under, under this item it's not, um, we, we don't find the definition there. Stated. Um, it's in the, I believe it's in the AR of the other three items, the, the 4119, and so you're referring to why isn't it in the 5145.7? Right. Mm -hmm. um, I. I haven't seen a whole lot of definition stated in the policy, more in the ARs. Okay, That's, got it. You know, and, and, and it's taken from the, the CS, the, the California <laughs> Board um, sample. Got it, thank and you. And when you're talking about AR, just for the public who might be viewing, what do you? Administration, yeah. Administrative regulation. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Here thank you go. You. People need to hear what that is. <laughs> okay, call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those? Uh, did you have a motion? Motion. Okay. Did, did we have a motion? Okay. Okay, now, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? N um, seven zero. 
Okay, I have to keep going. Um, the next one is board policy um, BPAR 4119.11, 4219.11, 4319 .11, also, also for sexual harassment. That's where, that's where the definition is. <laughs> um, can I have a motion? <coughs> I motion to approve. Second. Second. <clears throat> can I have, yeah, no, dis any discussion? No. <laughs> okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? 7-0. 9.5, second reading, BPAR 5145.13, response to immigration enforcement. Um, so can I have a motion? I move to approve. A second? Second. Any public speakers, any discussion from the board? <laughs> okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? 7-0. <laughs> second reading, update BP AR 5143.3, non-discrimination. 5145.3. 5145.3, non-discrimination harassment. Can I have a motion? I motion to approve. Second. A second. Okay. Sorry, Danny, you can have the second. <laughs> Any discussion from the board? <laughs> okay, he's, he's the second. <laughs> um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? 7-0. Um, 9.7 second reading, update BP 5146, married parent parenting students. I moved. Um, yeah, I'll have a motion. I move to approve. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? 7-0. <laughs> These are all <laughs> 9.8 second reading. Update BP 1250, visitors, outsiders. Can I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Second. Any discussion from the board? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? 7-0. 9.9 second reading update BP 0410, non-discrimination in district programs and activities. Can I have a motion? I'll make a motion. Can I have a second? Second. <laughs> Any discussion? <laughs> All those in favor? <laughs> Aye. Aye. All those opposed? 7-0. 9.10, second reading, update BP and AR 6145.2, athletic competition. Can I have a motion? I move to approve. Second. 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 Oh, um, any discussion? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All Aye. those. Of, okay. All those opposed? I'm going to abstain. What's that? I'm abstaining from this. Oh, abstaining. Mm -hmm. Okay. One abs and all. Um, so six. One abstention. And President Osmondson, I just I just noticed that somehow I squeaked in two of the same ones. So t uh, nine, ten, and nine, eleven are the same oh, board so policy. So we'll stop Okie dokie. So I'm going out to 912 now, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 912, second reading, update board policy AR 6159.4, behavior interventions for special education. Can I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. S any discussion? <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Seven zero nine thirteen. Oh, this is a different one. <laughs> I kept thank thinking, you. <laughs> you don't thank have to you. be here anymore, <laughs> Michael. Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
9.13, approve memorandum of understanding between PVUSD and Pottle Valley Federation of Teachers regarding, regarding bilingual stipends for migrant education, teachers in, mi in the migrant program. And um, report by Chona. PVFT has been keeping us busy. So in collaboration with the Pajaro Valley uh, Federation of Teachers, the Memorandum of Understanding was developed to provide clarification pursuant to Article 7 as related to bilingual stipends for teachers. Um, we agree that a teacher who holds a bilingual cross-cultural language and academic uh, development certificate or the BCLAD certificate and provides instruction to students in the migrant education department meets the requirement to receive the bilingual stipend. Um, this memorandum of understanding is effective starting this current school year and it impacts five teachers in the migrant program for a stipend of I believe 1600. All right, great. All right, can I have a motion? Move approval. Second. <coughs> any public speakers? No. Discussion from the board on this one? Is there any discussion? Anybody wants to bring anything up? No. Okay. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? 7 0. Um, 9.14. <coughs> Approved memorandum of understanding regarding professional growth opportunities in math and science. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, President Osmondson, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, this item is particularly important to our Director of Certificated Personnel and her team as we approach the peak of recruitment season. Um, there continues to be a national so shortage of certificated employees who possess credentials in math and science. As with special education teaching positions, the vacancies in math and science fields are very difficult to fill. Um, so working with PVFT, this uh, MOU was developed to address the shortage by encouraging our current employees who wish to pursue professional growth opportunities while concurrently supporting and promoting student achievement in their, turning, in their current teaching assignment. Um, eligible employees under this MOU shall receive tuition reimbursement for successfully completing coursework necessary to obtain a clear credential in math or science. Wow, sounds great. <laughs> question if there are no speakers well, can I have a motion first and a motion yeah I'll make a motion okay go ahead a second uh, a what second. are the eligibility requirements um, they that they are in a an approved uh, 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 program to obtain a credential in math and science and they have to be a, uh, a current employee for the school district okay so if we were to hire a new employee they could take advantage of that right away yes they could the but they have to be a new employee. Okay. They have to be an employee of our district. Okay. So what about um, if there's some contingency language around, you know, if we pay for you to complete your degree, you have to work for the district one to two years? Um, it takes um, time to, so when we reimburse their tuition, we reimburse it after they complete the coursework. Got it. So um, they, you know, we're not going to pay for it ahead of time. So they're they're concurrently working on the credential, on clearing the credential, as well as you know serving our students in these areas. Okay, thank you. They do auto, They automatically are our teachers in math and science when they finish, obviously. Yes. <laughs> if they uh, have a clear credential, we'd uh, we'd love for them to be math and science teachers. Yeah, so they don't they can't leave and become math and science teachers elsewhere, right? Um, they they could, um, but they in while they're doing their coursework, they have to be here, um, and they have to do th they have to be employees of the district for us to provide tuition. If they leave the district and they're still in the program, and we're not we're not going to be uh, reimbursing their tuition if they're no longer part of the district. I uh -huh. think what the board is asking is, is there a clause in there that mm -hmm. once that program is completed that they need to stay in the district and teach a year before they move on to another district? Can, uh, can we make policies like that? <laughs> we should be able to. Yeah. 
And the reason why I brought up the point is because the same thing happened with the uh, bus driver trainings, right? We train them, we pay for their training, and then after the fact, they don't stay with us. So I want to make sure that there is some sort of clause, like she mentioned. Thank you for the word. I was looking for it. Uh, that keeps those employees who are benefiting from our district and also providing service to our students, um, that they make sure that they, we, we have them for at least one to two years after the fact. Well, Chona, I, I just want to piggyback on both what Trustee um, Orozco and Shocker have said here, and I think that even beyond a one-year extension is reasonable. Let's look at, you know, what is the reasonable amount of time it takes the district to recoup that cost? Is it one, two, three, five years? So should we be making those extensions to, the, you know, to those periods of times? And this really isn't that different than what a lot of private sectors do with you know, helping students be complete their undergrads or in master's degree programs. So, you know, could you, you, or it seems like maybe Dr. Rodriguez wants to chime in, please elaborate. So we haven't checked with certificated staff. I will say we did investigate with the bus driver. So it was a desire of both the SEA and the district to put in a clause in order to maintain them within the district. Um, we researched it and by ed code we could not put in a clause that required them to stay within the district. I don't know if that clause was specifically for classified staff or not, so that is something I would have to research. I will say that we did specifically research for the bus um, driver because that, that came up and it is a $5,000 <laughs> cost that they could get trained with us and then leave and become a county bus driver and basically we paid $5,000 and we lost them. Um, so it is something, um, um, Francisco, did you want to say anything in terms of this item? So, so this MOU is for current employees. These are uh, employees that are already vested with the, within the district and in the community. Um, many of them have uh, in the past taught uh, math and science in a uh, class that may be grouped together, which allows them to use their multiple subjects credential for that purpose. Um, however, what the district needs is teachers that have a single uh, subject credential in math so that they can be assigned just math so that they are the math teacher. Um, the same thing with science. Um, the, the way the reimbursement works is that uh, while they may not have their, their credential, they would be assigned uh, another subject or another class um, while they're taking their, their classes. So the, and the reimbursement doesn't come until they complete the coursework. So by just by the functionality of it, they would have to be within the district at least another year after they get their, their credential. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't get their reimbursement. I think that part of the concern coming, uh, I'm going to speak on behalf of myself, and maybe it might be in line with what I've heard Trustee Orozco and Shocker say, is I'm hearing what you're saying that they're current employees, but it doesn't this policy would not just pertain to people that you see as members of the community who you believe are going to stay here and be here. They could, sure, they're here while they're doing it, but then they could get it and then leave. So I know that you have a motion and a second. It hasn't been voted on. That needs to be voted on based on the situation we're in. But I would recommend that we vote this down just so it gives you time to review what you've suggest, said you could do and bring it back to us at the next board meeting. Would you be able to, would we be able to amend our motion to just defer it to the next board meeting? Or, or that, th th that uh -huh. would even be. We could just move it. And, and if that's not possible as far as, you know, including a cost and, or, you know, um, then maybe it could be something, uh, I'm thinking of the new hires, right? Because obviously we're gonna be selling this as a, as a recruitment tool, for better lack of word. Um, so could it be somewhere on this MOU, could there be a requirement for an employee to at least be here three years before they can take advantage of this opportunity? And also stay here and beyond then stay, there. And then and whatever beyond that. that recoup time may be, one, two, three. Well, um, MOUs are all negotiated items, so we can bring back, I know that they're present, 
so we can first investigate whether or not we can do um, the language and then we can go back and have a conversation and we'll bring mm -hmm. it back at the next board meeting. Is the next board meeting sufficient time or do you need to table it to the second to next board if, meeting? If it's not, we, if, if we Agenda can get committee authority will just, just put, it, forward. put okay. it one more forward. I'm but I do want to say that I'm in full support of something like this because mm -hmm. I think it's very much needed in the district. Absolutely. It's just I want to make sure that we also keep our employees. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. So just really quick, the, the, the best way to keep employees is if you raise everybody's salary, right? <laughs> um, but so right now, though, we do have, uh, you know, school year starting in August, and you have a need for math teachers. You have a group of teachers that some of them have already taught math and science. They just don't have the credential for it. And so uh, giving them that support to get that credential and like I said, the way the reimbursement works, they will stay another year. And even if you do three years, there's no guarantee that they are going to stay here after three years. And so it, you know, um, anyway, it's not. Yeah. Oh, that's us. Oh, I understand that, Francis. So my concern is with. Yeah, I, I was thinking. You're fine with doing it, but I'd like board members to kind of get your hand up because I don't want two or three people jumping up at the same time just trying to talk. So you can bring that in more on. My concern is basically with new hires. I think that mm -hmm. our teachers are vested in our district, and they've shown that by their longtime commitment to this district. But I'm more concerned with a new hire coming on and taking advantage of the program and then leaving after a year. Mm -hmm. I just want to remind everybody that was five minutes. So. so I would like to. Um, amend the motion to table this item to our next board meeting if possible I'm actually gonna withdraw my second because I'm in support of this tonight as it as it reads I think time is of the essence and we need people a credential as soon as possible who are willing to teach math and science in our district so if somebody else wants to do the second I'll move to second Approved memorandum of understanding between PVUSD and Pottle Valley Federation of Teachers regarding peer assistance review committee compensation. Again, <laughs> thank you, um, President Osmondson, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Hopefully, this one's a little simpler. Um, we uh, worked with PVFT to make sure that we're regularly meeting with a peer assistance review, and this is a group that works with our teachers who've been in the district for a long time and that need a little bit more support, like coaching um, from their administrators or other teachers. And um, the group, uh, thanks to uh, our work with PVFT and um, uh, our Director of Certificated Personnel, Allison Izawa, um, is in full force. And so we just want to make sure that um, we have clarification that we're paying the teachers for the extra time that they're spending on um, the peer assistance uh, on, on the peer assistance review committee. Okay, good idea. Can I have can I have a motion? A motion to approve. Second. Any public speakers? No. Any discussion from the board on this one? No. Nope. Okay. All those in favor? Uh, aye. 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 All those opposed? Seven zero. Okay, 9.16, approved job description for coordinator in science. Yes, thank you. Um, again, this is in collaboration with PVFT. The job description for a science coordinator is critical to our efforts to transform our educational system so all students are college and career ready. Originally, this position combined two different educational fo uh, focus areas into one supervisory position. We originally had it as a coordinator of science and career and technical education. Um, as, we, as the board um, approved last time, um, P 
PVUSD is going to launch its own CTE pilot uh, program, so there is a need to separate the two important roles to achieve successful oversight mm -hmm. and implementation of both science and CTE. Yeah. An important PVUSD key lever is assignment to the Common Core, and the science coordinator's responsibilities will be focused on the major work for each grade level as defined by state standards, including next generation science standards. Uh, some of the representative duties for this position includes contributing to improve student achievement and increasing college and career readiness, monitoring operations, communications, and personnel to enhance program effectiveness, supervising and evaluating the performance of assigned staff, collaborating with other departments in preparation, review, and evaluation of grants, and providing technical expertise, information, and assistance to sites and uh, district departments. Great. Can I have a motion? A motion to approve. Second. Second. Uh, any public speakers? No. Nope. Any discussion from the board on this one? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? 7 0. And this is a new job description, and it's a classified one for Senior Project Manager for Facilities Bond Program. And I defer this to our Classified Director, Ms. Shanks, uh, to present this Ms. item. Shanks. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, President Osmondson, board members, Superintendent Rodriguez, and Cabinet. My name is Pam Shanks, and I am the Director of Classified Personnel that oversees the Merit System under the direction of our Personnel Commission in our district. Um, I am bringing forward the following class description um, entitled Senior Project Manager Facilities Bond Program, which will replace the current title of Supervisor of Planning. Um, I wanted to give you just a very brief overview of how new classified uh, class descriptions are established in the district. It's a little bit different than certificated. Um, and since we have some new board members, I wanted to make sure to um, explain this just very briefly. Um, when administration under the board's direction wants to create a new position, they submit the duties to the Director of Classified Personnel, me, at which point I prepare a class description. Uh, the Personnel Commission has the responsibility under the Education Code to prepare class descriptions and determine the title, minimum qualifications, and designate the salary placement on the appropriate salary schedule. Um, the board prescribes the duties and responsibilities of all positions in the classified service. So there is a dual approval process for new class descriptions um, in the classified service in our district. Uh, the Personnel Commission approved um, the attached class description and salary placement at their January 31st meeting. Um, basically this um, position, and I'll just give a very brief overview, and if you have any specific questions about the position, I did work with our CBO, Joe Dominguez, on the classification writing. Um, the senior project manager will supervise the design and construction of school facilities and modernization projects, ensuring that projects stay within budget and conform to established schedules. The position will supervise cost control, cost estimation, contract change manage management, and other project support <coughs> functions and activities. Um, this position is cost neutral, budgeted, and is not an increase in cost. It's simply replacing um, the supervisor planning position and will be at the same pay range as that former position. So this evening, I ask that the board approve the class description and revised management salary schedule as presented. Thank you. Can I have a motion? I move to approve as presented by Ms. Shanks. Second. Um, public discussion, okay, any discussion from the board? Georgia? So Ms. Shanks, I just wanna understand correctly from you, you're saying that there is this is just replacing a former position. Right, we had there, a, mm -hmm, go ahead. No pay range change. Correct. So, I guess I'm just a little cloudy here. Why the need to change the, the job description? Um, I think I might defer that to Mr. Dominguez to talk more specifically about the duties of what he's looking for. So the duties are changing? Um, yes, they are. Um, it's somewhat. I'm sure he can probably so explain the, more the detail. So the main difference that uh, we reviewed was the title. So in the industry uh, in that uh, this job description is titled Senior Project Manager and the previous position or the vacant position that we have is the Planning Supervisor. So similar roles but the title uh, uh, change allows us to uh, recruit and um, 
the capability of the position also requires project management, construction management, and then aligning with our um, allocated budgets within the bond program. So we're being more specific in the job description of the roles and responsibilities, but specifically it's the senior project manager uh, title. But again, so no, there, there, I'm sorry, let me go back. There were some changes within the job description. Yes. Okay, N no pay change. Correct, when we looked at um, salary ranges in the market, um, it was in line with what we were paying the former position. And you think that this opens up a greater recruiting possibility just by the glory of a job title? Not only the just the title, but the um, job description itself. It's more in sync with industry standards. So we took, I think, a minimum of dozen school districts mm -hmm. and did a comparable analysis. And all and within our region within our region and statewide as well okay and that's how they're structured it's a senior project manager and then they have construction managers and program or project managers they're different layers mm -hmm. but the senior project manager oversees the various projects has a team that they oversee okay and this person will be a direct report to whom this would be direct a report to the director of maintenance operations and facilities okay thank you you're Victor. welcome mm-hmm Okay, I, ha I did have a motion first and a second, so um, I'm calling for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? 7-0. Another job description is 9.18, approved job description for a counselor. Uh, thank you, uh, President Osmondson, uh, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, special kudos for this one to Director Suzanne Smith, um, HSAP Julie Edwards, who collaborated with uh, counselors extraordinaire and PVFT representatives, uh, Teresa Lerma and Wendy San Juan. Uh, this is a job description for a counselor. The last time the counselor job description was updated, um, the main one was in May 7th, 1974. And it was updated um, again in uh, September 21st, 1983, a little bit better for uh, middle school counselors. So um, this took a lot of work and kudos to the team, um, PBFT and our student services uh, team leading the way. And this revision of the counselor position uh, is, uh, was done to better reflect the important and valuable work of our counselors and ensure compliance with standards and requirements for our federal progress monitoring visit, as well as better alignment with the national uh, counseling standards. This position is critical to efforts, um, especially on our PVUSD key levers, um, including personalized learning, meaningful relationships, and informed instruction. As vital members of the school's educational leadership teams, counselors provide comprehensive and developmental support within the academic, personal, social, emotional, and college career domains to ensure that students become productive and well-adjusted adults. Some of the key representative duties is to create, implement, and evaluate a comprehensive school counseling programs that delivers services equitably to all students. Um, prioritize student needs to ensure um, acad in the academic, personal, social, and college career domains. Um, collaborate with student, staff, families um, to create an academic plan that ultimately results in a successful obtainment of a diploma and choice of post-secondary options. And provide responsive services to student to address student barriers to academic achievement and provide referrals to st of student families to district and community resources. Although, okay, do I have a motion? I'd like to um, make a motion to approve this counselor position. I wanna thank the cabinet for um, updating this position. It's very, very important and yeah. the counselor's role so, has mm -hmm. expanded uh, tremendously. Mm -hmm. And so I'm glad that this particular job description more accurately ref reflects Absolutely. what um, the capacity for helping our secondary Thanks. students. Thank you. Thank you. I second that. Motion. All right. So, any other discussion from the board? And what Kim says is very accurate. Mm -hmm. Obviously, mm -hmm. you all think that. Yes. <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? 7 0. Okay. So, is Nancy. Oh, there you are. 
Memorandum of understanding between HiSET and Watsonville Aptos Santa Cruz Adult Education. Good evening. Good evening. President Osmondson. How about that? President <laughs> Osmondson, <laughs> trustees, uh -huh. Dr. Rodriguez. How about that? And cabinet. Um, this is pretty standard. Um, we are offering the, we would like to offer the high set in Santa Cruz, in our Santa Cruz location. We have the GED here at the Green Valley Center and at the Santa Cruz location, location we will have a paper test rather than a computer. Um, the charge is $15 each. There are five tests. It's reading, writing, math, science, and social studies. And the tests are given on Thursday in Santa Cruz. And the, what'd you say? Tests are given Thursday in Santa Cruz at our Santa Cruz location. Thursday. Uh -huh. <coughs> okay, do I have a motion? I have a motion to approve. Second? I second. Um, any discussion? I, I want to ask. So, high set is what is basically the GED. Well, it's a different form, but it's it's put out by the educational testing um, services, ETS. But, um, okay, and 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 it's different from here in that they don't do it on a c computer. Here, the GED is now all computerized, and we offer the GED. Um, I still believe it's the only one in Santa Cruz County. We offer it here at the Green Valley Center. So we also wanted to offer the high set to give our students variety so they can have the GED or they can have high set. Either one is a high school equivalent exam. Okay. So and so they're going to have they're not going to have the GED there in Santa Cruz. They're going to have high, high set. Okay, that's what they're going to do there. Okay. President um, Trustee Osmondson, I had a question. Okay. I had my hand up. Um, Dr. Bilicich, could you please just elaborate for the board and the public again the di major significant differences between the GED offered here and the high set offered in Santa Cruz? Just anything that the you GED, significantly different. The GED is on a computer now. Um, in 2014, it was all paper based. Mm -hmm. and. They said no more paper-based. The state of California is just going to have the GED. At that time, uh, McGraw-Hill came through with um, TASC, and ETS came with HiSET and said to the state, why are we just having one test? What about us? So money talks, and they've said, okay, in California we can have the HiSET, and we can also have TASC, and we offer a computer-based test here at Green Valley Center and a paper-based one in Santa Cruz, they're similar and they're supposed to be equivalent. Equivalent and all those others. Supposed to be equivalent, GED. But if you know, GED is kind of known nationwide. HiSET wants that same status. They're not recognized in all states, nor is TASC, but GED seems to be. Yeah, they are. <laughs> GED, everybody knows what GED is. <laughs> Hi, Sid. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, Dr. Bilicich, this can significantly help people that are challenged for whatever reasons with a computer testing module program who are old school like me. And we like felt that we wanted to have the option for people to be on a computer because that's what GED was doing. We didn't have the choice anymore. But we also had an option for students to be paper tested. A lot more people are comfortable with paper. And just elaborate, I'm not computerly challenged, I just prefer paper. <laughs> <laughs> all right, if there's no more discussion, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? 7-0. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now for the 9.20 assistant superintendent contract. Okay. Said you're just doing one. Both. Okay. Yeah. So, um, thank you very much. So, for the last two years, and in, in um, at the next item, you will actually hear about the success that we're having, um, especially at the elementary level, but also um, throughout other schools at the secondary level. Many of that is attributed to the implementation of new programs that we have um, that we've put through. 
and the professional development that we've had for the teachers and for staff. And so we are bringing forward two assistant superintendent contracts. So it is um, for our assistant superintendent of elementary and our assistant superintendent of curriculum and instruction. Um, I wanted to note, and as is noted here, really the only major change is the timeline. So their contracts, um, both of their contracts expire June 30th, as is unusual um, with anyone else. A cabinet member cannot work a day past their contract. And so with any other job title, um, you basically have an ongoing contract. Even if you have contract negotiations, you still can work the next day. As a cabinet member, you cannot. Um, and so it is the exact same pay that they received um, when we received all received the increase in um, funding or increased in salary um, when negotiations close. So there is not increase. It is a change from two years ago when the contract was there or a year ago when the contract was there because we received the 6% um, following that. But there is not one from the other. And so we're um, encouraged, we feel that um, they're both um, great um, cabinet members and we want to maintain the consistency within cabinet. And so we encourage you to approve their contracts. Do I have a motion? Making a motion to approve the contracts of Susan Perez and Lisa Aguirre. Oh, it's Susan second. Perez. Is it Susan? Okay. And I have a second, right? You do. Okay. No. Um, I, is I there have any a question. Dis discussion from the board. Yeah, just yes. put your hand up. Okay. So, <laughs> just so I, know. I have a question. So I was going over the contracts, and my question is we do mileage reimbursement on a lot of these contracts, has the district ever looked into purchasing a car versus doing the monthly stipend? Yeah, so school districts throughout the state of California really transitioned from having district um, cars just because of the cost of maintenance of those cars and wear and tear on them. So most school districts now for cabinet members have the monthly stipend and do not provide the car. Um, I know in past years, just because my, my father was a superintendent for most, well, my childhood, um, he had a car for the first half of his superintendencies and then it, it faded um, from that. And so we, um, we do the monthly stipend. I will say that, um, you know, we travel significantly, not only within the district, but also going up to the COE and all throughout and we don't collect mileage for any of those trips. So. Any other comments? Okay, Georgia. Um, so, Susan and Lisa, um, I just wanna say that I will be voting no on renewing your contracts tonight, and please understand that it is 100% not performance-based. Your direct reports to the superintendent, so she hasn't indicated anything, I think, to any governing board members in closed session or any other session about anything about your performance. Um, I have consistently said in public meetings that I have some concerns and issues with some of the provisions within the assistant superintendent's contracts. Also have deep seated concerns about the top heaviness of the district's administration, particularly within the cabinet. Believe that some of these positions could be consolidated. Um, so on that basis, because it's clear that the governing board is not willing to look at, the, at that at this time, my vote will be no tonight, but please do know it's nothing based on your performance. Okay, so I have a first and a second, don't I? Yes. Me too. I do have a first and a second. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Aye. Okay, that's, it's, um, that would be a no. Five, two, zero. Okay, five, two, zero. <laughs> okay. Um, now I'm on report and discussion items. 10.1 PVUSD instructional cycle and map report will be report will be presented by Lisa Aguirre and Susan Perez and Christian Schaus, assistant superintendent.
Good e Is this on? Yeah. Good evening, um, President Osmondson, Dr. Rodriguez, and members of the board. Um, we are here to provide you with an update um, on our most current MAP scores and our summits. Um, but I do want to first start out by explaining our overall um, cycle for instructional improvement because both summits and MAP scars, scores are really part of this cycle that we implement on an annual basis. And the way our cycle works is, um, well, the purpose, let me back up a little bit, the purpose really is to make sure that we're making data-driven decisions and that we are monitoring the instructional improvements that we're making based on those decisions. So we start the year out by having our schools analyze their state test scores, the CASP scores. Students take a MAP score in the, a uh, MAP test in the fall, those are analyzed. Schools then set goals based on the data. Our principals come together in October for their fall summits where they share what their um, goals will be for the year based on their data. They then begin implementing the work towards meeting those goals. Cabinet members um, perform a fall walkthrough of our school sites where we are collecting data to help schools monitor their progress towards the goals. Midway through the year, our school students take their second MAP assessment of the year to determine growth from fall to winter. We then invite certain schools in for a mid-year map, depending upon growth, or excuse me, mid-year summits, based on growth from those map scores. And then we continue monitoring instruction, and Cabinet does a second round of site visits in the spring, continuing to monitor the growth and their goals. Then at the end of the year, our students take their third and final MAP assessment of the year, and we have our, our end of year summits where principals um, join us and review their overall year-long progress towards their goals, and then we have discussions about the following year and what kinds of goals need to be put in place and actions for the following year. So it is a full year-long cycle. And now we're going to share with you some of the results um, from our fall to winter or mid-year MAP assessment. Good evening. The honor of talking about some of that work that we were just discussing in terms of the growth that we've had at elementary school. And my voice is raspy, so I'll apologize for that in advance. Uh, taking a look at the gains that we've had across the board with MAP, the second through fifth grade level, you can see that the numbers there are indicating that uh, we're ranging basically anywhere from remaining st stable at that 94% in third grade, uh, it, which is in that small box off to the right-hand side, all the way up to a growth pattern of 31% increase. So that is substantial. Uh, by far, the most telling piece of how well we're doing is looking at this column here. So when you take a look at growth, the expectation is that we're making at least that year's growth. But as we've all heard, when you're trying to create that gap divide and squeeze that down, you have to make more than a year's growth. So as you can see, every level, our second grade is actually making, is on projection to make two years growth, uh, which is substantial, uh, an indicator that the early literacy efforts that are going on in the programming is working. Uh, what you'll see also moving forward from third through fifth grade is that movement that they are also getting more than one year's growth pattern. To do kind of that deeper dive and look at actual individual sites, we'll take a look at the elementary breakdown. Up here you'll notice that this is the mathematics breakdown for elementary school. Um, I, I realize that it's a lot of numbers when you kind of look at that grid, so to orient yourself in terms of what that is looking at, uh, your norm study is 10.2 uh, million students take the test. Uh, of that, this would be what we typically see come in. So in fall, which is the F18 that you're seeing there, we would expect a second grader to be coming in and doing that first assessment at 176.9. That growth pattern to the winter, which is the W indication here, then shows you about a 10-point growth. So that would be what we would see as average across all of the students taking this test. What we want to see is basically those greens and blues light up this board, which is essentially what is exactly occurring. What it's showing you is the growth pattern of how far we've come. The only indicator that we need to be aware of as well, and this is what we're working with site leaders on, is that this area where we may be receiving students, 
or where we may be starting with a student is potentially lower than what that norm already is. So from a teacher standpoint, not only do you have to gain that five uh, point growth or that mm -hmm. 10 point growth, but to really establish and get that gap divide, we have to continue to see those greens and blues. Strong indicators that the continuous improvement is happening, but again, that level of urgency that just that we're seeing that does not mean that we can kind of pump the brakes and be okay with where we're at either. So a lot of the conversations that we've had uh, with leadership and our site principals too is how do we engage folks in the message that yes, the work is working and that we're doing great things, but keeping that consistency moving forward so that we have that continuous growth pattern. You'll also notice that in these areas, the purple and the pink, those are actually positives as well. So what you're gonna notice with those is that those are actually above, so let's take Rio for instance, the norm study on a winter rate is 186.4. You'll notice that they're at 187. So they're above what the norm is right now. So those pink and uh, purple bands, so to speak, that you're looking at is actually an indicator that per performance wise or proficiency wise, they're lining up closer to what we would expect them to see moving forward on CASP and SBAT. To take a look at elementary in regards to reading. So again, you'll see that, that large charge with the greens and blues, which is exactly what we want to see. And those that have already hit the purple and pinks are the ones that are already in that performance band that's indicating that they are within the norm range of what's already occurring. So again, uh, amazing kudos to the staff, the teachers, and all of the folks that are leading the work with professional development because it is working for our students moving forward. So this will go back to the same story. So all of the data tells a story from one level to the other. So as I indicated and I showed you in second grade, if in second grade we already are at that disadvantage of having 10 points below on the writ, then what we end up handing off sometimes with middle school may also be lower. So what you're seeing is that consistency cycle of the new initiatives that are going through are now hitting those upper level bands of those four or five. So this will adjust as well. However, there's immediacy as well because students that are in our system right now need us to be able to do something different as well. Uh, you'll see that these are yellows. It is not what we want in any uh, shape or means in terms of moving forward. But what I want you to, to look at as well is these pieces. So this was fall of 18. I'll take Cesar Chavez, for instance. The average coming into a sixth grade, according to, uh, to, to the norms, is 217. Mm -hmm. So receiving kids of, of where we had at 201 already puts folks at a disadvantage to really make that next bump up. So even though you're seeing the indicator of growth here with the 5.4, which is, is positive because we have growth going, we still, if you look at the 207 versus the 222, still have a ways to go. Um, so again, it's uh, talking with our leaders and our teachers as well about celebrating the small ones that we do have, but also making sure that we accelerate that growth and continue to move forward. You'll also notice with high school, uh, fresh off the presses with our data that we have from high school, so they've just finished their map. You'll notice that there's a trend in the norms as well. So higher level students, as you get further into the high school level, it becomes harder to move students. Um, that growth range looks a little different. So you can see that the norm was two point growth. So again, it, you know that analogy that it is a slightly easier uh, when we have younger folks moving forward because you're gonna see larger growth gains. When you hit the high school level, you're gonna see a smaller range. So in a sophomore year, you can expect a one point growth. Again, you'll notice that uh, this is Aptos High, so you'll notice that pink and purple band. That means that they're all, already performing within that norm range. Uh, we also have some sites that are fairly close, but we still have some more work to do. So again, we're receiving freshmen, we're at 219, which is off from what we would be receiving if we were uh, potentially in, a, in another uh, place, but again, to the 221. So are we getting growth? Yes. Are we within that average that we want to be in? Not yet. Um, so addressing it and moving forward, we're looking at a low-performing block grant that's targeting our middle schools in addressing this to provide additional support. Uh, we've also done some leadership breakdowns with what our action plans are with really making sure that we celebrate those wins because it is positive news that we are getting growth now it's that place of going, how do we keep folks motivated to continue to push forward with that growth um, and really look at the intentionality of what we're doing instructionally as well. And I will hand it over to my counterpart. Okay, so another way of looking at the data, I'm gonna go back one slide. So, so 
when the students take a test, they have a RIT score at the beginning of the year. Every student is assigned a projected growth. They take it again in the winter, and it's calculated to see how they did in terms of whether they met their projected growth or not to get the one year's growth. Now, across the nation, students are put into similar bands based on where their RIT score, the, where they scored. And there's a, something called a conditional growth um, percentile, which is looking at how students did as compared to their counterparts across the nation. If you think of a bell curve, your um, yellow is gonna be right in the center. Your blue, the green and the blue is gonna be on the um, right side, the upper end, which is above the average for growth. And then the orange and the red, the lower growth, which is on the left side of the bell curve. When we look at our school, when we look at our schools up here, what we wanna see is these bands being yellow and blue. So which means that, for example, yellow and, I'm uh, sorry, green and blue. So um, what we're seeing is at H.A. Hyde, 95th percentile. So this is looking at students that are reaching their goal and how they are doing as compared to the rest of the nation. So it was um, indicated that we have some growth to do. The more blue and green that we have, the more that we're, our students are increasing their RIT scores and the more that they're reaching their goals and that we're closing the gap. For reading, if you look, we have, um, the, this is the literacy, the foundational literacy. It's showing a great improvement in our schools where we see lots of blues um, within for the reading. So if you look at Minty White right here, 97th percentile, 91st, 99th, and 96th, which is fantastic. So there, this is as compared to students across the nation. So one of the things that we look at in terms of the second summit was mentioned um, is that we're looking at for the conditional growth, the percentile ranks to see how students grew or not. So we wanted to look at which schools had in multiple areas, um, multiple grade levels in both math and reading had low performing growth. Um, and looking at that and doing an analysis, so first let me show you um, secondary. Um, what was mentioned is that we're gonna be bringing back the low, um, the block grant, the low performing block grant. So we're gonna be focusing on middle school because if we look at middle school, we don't see as much growth that we did in the elementary. High school is doing a good job here. And then this is for the reading for the um, secondary. So once again, our focus will be middle school. Then looking at all of the different, the growth percentiles, we've identified the schools that will be coming forward for a second summit. What we're asking the schools to do, they come forward and we say, okay, at the beginning of the year, you laid out an instructional plan for your school. Let's go back and look at possibly what's working, what's not working, because right now, what's indicating is that we're not getting the growth in their students that we wanna see, and we need to look at what we're gonna tweak mid-year and try some new things so that we can see how the growth happens at the end of the year. We're not gonna wait until the CAF sport, CAS scores come out and they take the test. So we want um, schools to actually alter some of their instructional um, focus and their plans mid-year course corrections. And that's one of the reasons why we use the map. So the, these are the identified schools that are gonna be asked to come for a second summit to, so that we can collaborate and work together. With that, So I have a question. How are the charter schools in our district ranking on MAP? I noticed that they weren't listed. Um, not all of our charter schools use MAP. Alianza and Watsonville Charter School for the Arts do. Um, I have not looked at length at the Alianza. I know that Wixa did very well on their MAP assessment. So, yes, um, we are going to be including the charters. We're going to go back and get that data so that we can bring that through. The, the dependent charters, right? The dependent charters, okay. yes. And then you said you, you do have um, some initiatives <coughs> in place or in plan to help with the middle school performance with this new grant coming through? We do. Do you want to address yeah, that Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, and we will be bringing the board back further information as to what that grant will entail and really what the focus areas are looking at. Um, to start the conversation though with all of our leadership groups, we looked at three major things with that key shift of change and making sure that we have urgency. Um, so we looked at how do we increase urgency without increasing the panic or the overwhelming piece that goes with it as a leadership group as well. Uh, in addition with our principals, we looked at positive messaging so that we're making sure that we're honoring the work that is being done that is really positive moving forward uh, to keep that engagement level. And then the last piece that we looked at is how do we message with our staffs that we're working with and how do we involve them in the process of empowering them to become part of the conversation as to, to the direction that we may go as well. So that work's already started through our principals group and our leadership team, but the next level of that will be going to, to really that support block grant to really look at student connection, literacy foundations, which would add on to that vertical alignment that we're seeing with elementary schools. Um, and then looking at the building capacity and anchoring ourselves to what positive instruction and good instruction looks like according to best practices. I do, I have a question, may I? Um, so I notice under math for middle school, uh, specifically for Paro Middle School, there was a decrease, a negative 0 0.3 decrease in their scores. So they're not making growth, and I'm wondering if there was something that specifically, some, you know, some sort of finding um, that resulted in that decrease in performance. Sure, so we actually took a look at that over winter break as well. We uh, called in our site administrative teams as well and looked at what can we do to support. Uh, our math coordinator as well was involved in that conversation as well as our coaches. Uh, and it really became looking at the structure of what do our daily lessons look like? What are the observable pieces and in learning intentions that we have for students and what are the level of expectations? So we've redesigned really what the support level looks like. We've had coaches on campus every single day to look at that as well and really changing the dynamics of what our expectation is for students with those learning intentions uh, to increase that support. Uh, in large part, he does have a, a staff that is on the newer side and is still being coached. Um, as indicated earlier in the presentation, the shortage with math and science teachers is real. So uh, really a lot of the staff that he is working with, uh, not to say that veterans or you know rookies are, are one or the other in terms of, of worth, but it is one of those pieces that you do learn as you go through the process. Uh, so providing teacher feedback, uh, which also came out in the Youth Truth Survey in terms of really providing folks with information and feedback as to change practice and to be better at practice uh, is also a part of that plan. Um, so yes, the, the teachers are well aware of it as well. It is, it certainly hits them just as much mm -hmm. as it does anybody else. Uh, and nobody's happy really with the results that we saw. So they are a part of that process of moving forward with the Pajaro team as well. Then my other question is, are um, our charter schools also included as part of the summits? The gatherings where principals come together. To I don't have the institutional practices. history, so I'm going to pass off. Okay, great. Yes, they yes, they are. Are. Great, yeah. So I know that um, before I think students took the MAP scores, the MAP test, I'm sorry, uh, I did ask for that information to be included as part of this report. Obviously, it wasn't. So I think moving forward, at least with our dependent charter schools, I do want to make sure that they're being included. They are part of our district. They are our students um, in, in everything that we do. Yes, absolutely. I just do want to mm -hmm. clarify that only Alianza and Watsonville Charter School for the Arts take MAP. Our secondary charter schools do not. Is there any way that we, anything that we can do to fix that? So during my visit to Renaissance, I mean, not Renaissance, excuse me, to P, um, PCCS just this past week, I did have a conversation with, um, with Drew um, regarding that. And so um, I, we, because our Tuesdays are our meetings, I didn't get a chance to talk to Susan about it yet, but we need to check in to see um, if we can support um, that funding. So at this time, PCCS doesn't have, because they are such a small school, they don't have the funding in order to be able to mm -hmm. support it. And so it would need to be district supported. I think if it's an initiative that we have throughout the entire district and we're including them, um, then we need to try to make that happen. And yes. I think using our mass purchase um, can be helpful. Yeah, that would be great. I think that's, that's the direction I want to go. Um, and then, um, let's see. I'll come back to me. <laughs> and how about John 
in tech and um, I guess and Renaissance. Yeah, so no, so no, no, Seba no, no, and Lynn Scott we would not um, support no, no, because no. they are deep in, they're independent sauce. charters. Um, however, we can uh, we can have a conversation in post board on how we could include the others. Um, the question with Renaissance has come up with, um, you know, they do there's most of their students do have a map score out there because they come from our our regular traditional high schools for the most part, and so um, that could be something that we would we may have to bring it back to the board because of the cost factor, and then just have it as an action item for approval. So Diamond Tech, um, there, I, I Marcy has not expressed to me that she wants to use um, Map. She has a very unique structure that is working for her. I mean, she had a presentation during her renewal that shows that she's making outstanding progress, and they use more of a portfolio assessment process. And so um, I think the question with that is, do we mess with it since it seems to be very working? Um, and so I'm not sure if Diamond Tech, but we'll have a discussion and we can bring it back as an action item for sure. Thank you. So just, I'm just going to ask you, so MAP is taken three times a year, is that correct? Yes. At the beginning of the year, in the middle of the year, and at the end of the year, MAP is taken. It's a three assessment yes. kind of approach. And the idea of that is um, different than CASP, which is a one time a year kind of a thing. And the map is able to just see if they're moving from one level to another each time they're taking the test or whatever. Yes, we're looking at the student. Correct. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. And just one last comment, if I may, President. <laughs> um, I know that we tend to focus on why are our kids not making the growth that we want to see them making, but I do want to acknowledge the hard work of everyone involved, from the administrators down to the teacher, down to the principal. So thank you for all the work that you do on our school sites. It's obviously working. And I just want to note, um, when you guys saw these scores two years ago, it was mostly red. And so um, we had very little blue at all. I'm not sure we even have blue. So, um, so I think people's, and it's all about mid-course corrections, right? So this is all, it's no judgment. It's just problem solution, right? So in some cases, there's a con there's an issue. And so what can we do differently the second half that will result in good student learning? Um, and so that's the approach that we're taking. Um, and the summits are very collaborative. They've changed them over the years. Um, and so it really is a sharing of best practices and how can we continue to move our students forward. Um, so I, I do understand how MAP works, but just looking at all these charts makes my eyes like go in circles. So I just have a couple of questions. First of all, I like that Rio Del Mar is, is being brought back to a summit because typically in every other old system we used to work at, they would just kind of rest on their laurels because they're, they're such high achieving kids there. Um, so I really like that if they're not making progress, they are held accountable to, to why not. So anyway, so I want to say thank you for that because I think when we have a lot of high flying kids we need to challenge them and make sure that they are we're meeting their um, educational needs so I love that what is going on at Starlight can anyone speak to that for math or reading? Um, e either for either so well, I'm looking sorry I'll tell you I'm looking at um, reading I think right now yeah reading yeah with Starlight it's um, all red Yes. So last year they actually had great growth. This year, yeah. the first from the from the fall to the winter, um, it did not translate as they were going last year. Um, we're looking at a couple of different program um, differences. One of the things is that last year there the the way that they did the student goal setting was one, um, and they didn't do as much this year. The second thing is that within their um, classrooms that the they're looking at with the, the teachers, it was more of a rushed. And so Jackie and I had a long conversation, the principal and I had a long conversation about the testing environment. We also looked at um, the different components that could have gotten um, in the way. 
at this time because they had they had such great growth last year and right now it was the one year dip we're not in a panic mode to figure out we're kind of trying to find out why depending on what happens at the end of the year so they are bringing brought um, she is coming in and we're just have further discussion with her colleagues at the end of the year if there is still not as much growth then we're really going to try to investigate to figure out why but right now we're looking at it as we're there's not a huge difference other than the testing environment number one they did it differently and then also within the um, the student growth goal setting so Yes. That they did last year. They were, we're looking at the difference in what happened because there, they have, there has not been any huge progr um, programmatic changes at the school site. So another, uh, just this, indulge me, this is like a personal question. Like, you know, I used to work in my child's classrooms, both my son and my daughter at Valencia. Um, the pace that those teachers had to keep to keep up with the pacing calendars were like, I, I mean, I, I, f I was anxious like just sitting in the class working alongside the teacher um is there any is, is there any way we could slow it down so that kids could actually grasp concepts so that we're not just like zooming through stuff you want to jump in this? yeah, yeah I think, think, so so it does go back to research in this so what yeah. we do know is that the remediation or the slowing process of the pacing actually doesn't assist uh, students in that growth pattern, okay. but the intentionality of the interventions that we're doing and the application that we're doing. So there really is a push for us to look at the lens of when, I, when we talked about that anchoring of what does good instruction look like, it's getting back to those basics of looking at the strategies that we're using in classrooms so that we're really able to elevate that and then put the right programs in place to make sure that we get that push. Mm -hmm. uh, again, that personalized learning piece that you guys heard us discussing with the counselors piece as well, which is really differentiating so that we're pulling kids back and doing that reteaching piece within without having to push kids out to yeah. receive the same level of support. And, and, our, and I think, you know, having a few years ago, um, we voted for and negotiated <laughs> teachers negotiated for and I really pushed for this is probably like four years ago now that in the elementary schools for them to have release time so that they could get together and do that what do they what do you call it um, but it's data collaboration. Oh, collaboration. collaboration time so that they can really have a moment to take a breath and together as a grade level look at data and I think that's been um, very helpful in terms of being <coughs> able to help differentiate potentially <laughs> no do you, no no any times that teachers have the opportunity to collaborate mm -hmm. with their colleagues and look at student work is a great opportunity and will help um, with the student learning, absolutely. It's included in that, that piece that we talked about, the low performing block grant. That is mm -hmm. one of the measures that we're looking at is that collaborative time that we have with sixth grade teachers together, seventh grade teachers together yeah. to really look at subject alike pieces. I really um, like the, um, this idea that you are not judging um, teachers and staff that you're supporting and that feels um, wonderful and so um, hopefully hopefully it, it translates to our kids learning better so thank you We're going to do another set of first readings again. And these are board policy update 5145.7. And this is the first reading of the following board policies. It will come back to the board at this next board meeting for our approval. Please let the superintendent know of any concerns or changes you would like either tonight or prior to the next board meeting. And they will be presented by Mr. Berman. Hello Director again. Yeah, you said all the piece that I was going to say. This is the first reading. Um, the first one is student records, um, <coughs> excuse me, board policy 5125. It pertains to three new laws that have been passed in the state, um, primarily around uh, citizenship and immigration status. No, 
both speakers now. Okay, this is not a motion or anything like that. <laughs> Yeah, so is there any discussion? <coughs> and where, uh, but this is not the one. He looks like <coughs> this is not the one he was standing in. <coughs> no, I know, but I, I didn't see that this is the one. It didn't look like that was the one he was doing. <coughs> so there's no comments from the board on this one? That's because he's doing 10.2. Yeah, because he's doing a different one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, first reading update BP 6164.2 Guidance Counseling Service. Um, again, this is updated based on a, a new law, uh, SB 451, um, and it just articulates some um, responsibilities of school counselors. Okay. Any discussion? Go ahead. Do we have current capacity to meet this new regulation for our counselors, guidance, guidance counselors? We won't have a choice but to create that capacity because it's um, become ed code. So that's why I'm wondering, do we need to look at hiring new counselors or? Well, I think that that's something that the board has wanted. Right. I think when we look at our budgetary concerns, then that can be something that we can discuss with um, doing that. That's something that the board has discussed for the two years that I've been here in terms of lowering that ratio. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 10.4, mm -hmm. first reading of updates to BP dash AR 1312.3. And these next two um, items are based on the feedback that we got from our FPM reviewers. So this item right here, 1312.3, uh, is our UCP policy that was just updated in December. Um, however, the reviewers said that the California School Board sample that we used previously um, has been slightly changed in the last couple months. And it, and it um, shows how, how closely they're looking at the policies for this review that's coming. So we're still gonna have a second one of this one too, obviously. Okay, comments from the board. 10.5, first reading of update AR 1312.4, William Uniform Complaint Procedures, okay. We know, the, we know about those. <laughs> yeah, and for this one we were, we were asked simply to take out any mention of the, um, the high school exit exam because that's no longer law. Okay. So there's not any discussion from the board on that one. Okay. Okay. Now we're doing the consent agenda, agenda which is le 11. I'd like to make a motion to approve our c consent agenda with um, special appreciation um, to uh, the Bruce W. Wolpert Algebra Academy for partnering with our district and other schools in Santa Cruz County and trying to help our kids achieve better in math. And we thank his family and um, Granite Rock for that opportunity for our kids in this district. Yeah, Granite Rock. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there any items that the board wishes to defer? No? And, and there, is there a second? We did, did we do a second? I second. Okay. I will call for a vote then. All in favor of the consent agenda? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. We're gonna do. Wait, one absent. Oh, there's oh, one absent. Right, so. Um, we're closing out on this one, and we're going to go back now to closed session. <coughs> so we're going to have.
So I'm going to go to 9.21. Approval of letter to district attorney's office. Can I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the letter with the following amendments to the letter. In paragraph two, sorry, hold on. In paragraph two, line eight, um, after Dodge to add junior. And in paragraph two on line 11, to remove the wording to the group. And that's it. Is there a second? It needs a second to prove it with those two amendments. Yes, okay. Okay, it looks like the second has died. Correct? Second has died. So Oh, so we need another motion. So I move to approve the letter with the following amendment of adding uh, trustee Dodge Jr., adding Jr. to the line that was mentioned in the previous motion. Yeah. Okay. Do I have a second? I second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Um, failed. No. I mean, I moved. I mean, it failed. I mean, what was it? Okay. Six, one. And move six one. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, so, so I'm going on the action report on closed section session. Do I want to have the expulsion and then the rest? She is. Okay, I move to approve um, a full expulsion for number eighteen nineteen zero zero nine. Um, with a recommendation of the district administration for a full expulsion for the remainder of the 1819 school year and the fall semester of the 1920 school year with placement at another school outside of the district on a strict behavior contract. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Seven zero. Agenda item 2.2, .2, the, the certificated personal personnel report. I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by district administration on February 13th, 2019 with 242 action items. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, all, <laughs> okay. all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 2.3, classified personnel report. I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on February 13th, 2019 with 130 and seven additional action items. Second. I'm oh, sorry, Maria. Maria can have the second. Okay. All those in favor. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And in item 2.7, the board vetoed 70 to provide settlement authority to close multiple claims. Claim number 8106-02-0126 and item 8106-010086 for employee number 4030. And for item 2.8, Claim B, the board voted 7-0 to provide settlement authority to close multiple claims. Number 457286 for employee number 5019. Motion. Motion. We voted on closed session, so he was just reporting out. 
I'm not sorry. It's been a long night. <laughs> so I, this is right. Okay, just just a little bit of background of our employees. On behalf of our superintendent and district administration, we are pleased to announce Mrs. Ruth Gonzalez's appointment to manager risk and safety. Mrs. Gonzalez brings to the Pajaro Valley Unified School District a wide breadth of experience in both safety and risk. Mrs. Gonzalez has worked in human resources where she was in charge of creating safety training programs, conducting accident investigations, and developing and implementing a variety of standard operating procedures. Mrs. Gonzalez successfully completed her JD degree from the Monterey Co College of Law and worked and has worked for a local law office where she performed legal research and analysis and worked with employers regarding OSHA cases and workers' comp. Mrs. Gonzalez graduated from Watsall High School, and we are proud to welcome Ms. Gonzalez to our district as the new manager of risk and safety. On behalf of the superintendent di district administration, we are pl pleased to announce Mrs. Lauren Adcock's promotion to manager payroll and benefits. Mrs. Adcock b began her career with the PVUSD as a payroll technician in 2012 and moved into a payroll analysis position in 2017. Mrs. Adcock has shown her strong uh, analytical abilities through the many changes in payroll laws over the past several years and has been instrumental in the implementation of a financial system that crosses many departments. As the district moves into another financial system implementation, we look forward to Mrs. Adcock leading the payroll and benefits department in this endeavor. We welcome Mrs. Adcock into her new position as manager of payroll and benefits. And thank you.